Okay, good evening. Uh, just checking everyone can see my screen before I launch into it. Yes, I think yeah, so. Okay, that's great. Uh, and apologies, my webcam just refuses to work with GoToMeeting tonight, and I don't know why. So we'll just press on, and I'll show my, my slides. Uh, so, so good evening, and thank you for inviting me to talk tonight. Um, and so what I've, I've been asked to present on is the subject of why open data, or why open your data, I guess. Um, so I thought we'd start with the definition, what is open data? Um, and so there are a number of useful definitions we can have, one of which is this one from the Open Data Handbook, which says, open data is data that can be freely used, reused, redistributed by anyone, subject only at most to the requirements to attribute and share alike. Uh, and that's quite an open and generous uh, way of doing it or interpreting it. Um, and so you can see that the four key elements of that are the access, the format, um, the machine readability is, is an important part of this, and the open license, the, the freeness to use the, the data for another purpose, commercial or uncommercial. Uh, and although open data can come from any source, essentially, um, including private business um, and members of, of the community at large generate their own data through things like Wikidata and so on. Tonight, I'm going to focus mainly on uh, government data. Um, and so the, the history of UK open data, um, primarily, I mean, there are instances before this, primarily starts in 2010 with the Cameron and Clegg coalition government, um, who I think less than two weeks after coming into um, to power, um, sent this letter to government departments and local authorities um, saying that the intention was to open up uh, spending data. Um, and that had something of a catalytic effect in terms of getting bodies and um, councils started. Um, and it's worth noting that this didn't apply to Scotland and never has, and I think that's been to the detriment of Scotland's publication of open data, uh, which is something that's quite of a hot potato for me for the last 10 years at least. Um, and then we moved to 2013, and the UK government was one of the signatories to the G8 Open Data Charter. And so that essentially committed us to, um, or legally committed us to um, be publishing open data. Um, and that is, is still in force um, and is still a, a useful lever when we try to persuade people that they should be doing more than they are currently doing. So, so having that legal underpinning and that, that reason why um, data should be published, um, we can start to look at the benefits of, of doing so. Um, and so, so there are two sources here for what I've put on the slide, um, one of which is from the Open Data Handbook again, one from the European Data Portal. Um, and both things are really saying principally the same things, um, that Essentially, you've got um, different parts of the open data community uh, and champion or have interests in different benefit areas. For example, um, transparency campaigners may primarily be interested in the, the transparency aspect of data being published. And as Louis Brandis said in 1914, sunlight is the best disinfectant, uh, although probably not in the way that Donald Trump recently suggested. Um, and so these, these benefits, transparency around innovation, around improvements in effectiveness, um, you know, how we measure policies impact, um, and new knowledge is gained for there. They, they, they don't stand uniquely or singularly. They actually often interact with one another. And so publishing some data will often have multiple benefits, as we will see in a moment. Um, and so if, if we um, start to look at government data that is being published and then we think about what the insights we can derive from that, then you know the, the government makes a good deal of data available as open data, particularly the UK or English, English government, um, uh, which is a great thing. Uh, but sometimes the scale or format that data that's published can mean that the average citizen to make sense of it is quite challenging. And so it might be ticking the transparency box, but actually interrogating the data to find you know, the patterns or connections that something or something more in there um, can be quite challenging. Uh, and so there are some examples of platforms or sites to, to, to assist with this. So the first one I've chosen is openprescribing.net, um, 
which is a, a fantastic resource which was established by Dr Ben Goldacre and his colleagues at Oxford University. Uh, and not only does this allow citizens to see at the local GP practice level what drugs are being prescribed and compare that with others, but it also reveals to them patterns in the data showing where efficiencies could be made. Um, sadly, my, my attempts to broker a deal between NHS Scotland and Open Prescribing to get Scottish data into this platform uh, went as far as a, as a phone call with NHS Scotland, uh, who went off to think about it, and more than about a year and a half later are still thinking about it. So, sadly, it's only England's data that's in there, but it's very valuable and very interesting, and it's certainly worth looking at if uh, for your for your own local area and see what your GP practice is, um, you know, what their practice is doing. Another good example is Open Corporates. So this is started uh, quite a few years ago by Chris Taggart, um, an early pioneer of, or, or champion of open data in the UK. Uh, it's now worldwide. Um, and uh, so both of these examples I've shown you are uh, fit the transparency bill, uh, but, but open prescribing also addresses efficiency and effectiveness um, because you can look beneath the data rather than just finding out what's happening as it were. So, not, so another aspect um, of open data benefits is democratic engagement. Um, and so some of you may have heard of uh, My Society. Um, they have built a number of really useful tools, which some of which you may well have used uh, to help with engagement in the, the broader democratic process. And these span uh, transparency and FOI, but also there are tools to help you uh, use data um, such as your MPs voting records or election data or constituency data uh, and they create tools to help you interact with those elected officials. Um, and as Simon mentioned earlier, uh, one that's dear to my heart is Democracy Club, uh, for whom I am a, a non-executive director. And, and this in some ways is more grassroots, so it uses a combination of both officially published open data, but it's highly supplemented by crowdsourced data. Um, and this helps citizens engage with more prospective councillors or MPs. It also helps them to find out where to vote. Um, and provides a number of APIs and widgets, which have been in the past and continue to be regularly used by institutions such as the BBC, the Guardian, local authorities, and others. Um, so, so some some would argue that both of these organisations, My Society and Democracy Club, are filling the gaps in what should actually be delivered in a core service by government, but but largely isn't. And I think that's a, an interesting debate to have to say. How do you shift some of these into government, or is that the right thing to do, or should it always sit outside um, and, you know, be protected, I, I guess, from budgetary cuts and so on? So, so my next uh, benefit I'm going to look at is is social impact, um, and um, other organisations um, that we'll see in a second are much more focused in this area. For example, um, the Open Street Map uh, humanitarian team. Uh, they use an open platform and data, plus a community effort to provide valuable resources for organisations such as uh, Doctors Without Borders. Um, uh, during Ebola outbreaks in 2014 and other years, they've done very in interesting things, uh, such as used motorcycle riders with GPS on the ground in Africa, mapping, or finding the coordinates of tracks that exist that are no, no, not mapped and then using those in co combination with satellite imagery and people sitting back in the UK or Europe or elsewhere, um, actually making maps in, in live, as it were, in sessions, hack, hack sessions, which are then immediately live to the aid workers for the next day. Um, so, so it's a very powerful um, piece of work um, and has real impact. Um, Another one you may have come across is 360 Giving. Uh, so it's established about three, four or five years ago, I think. Uh, and they have developed um, a standard for funders to publish their funding data in a structured way. And once it's been done, then that allows the data to create insight. And they build tools to analyze or visualize the data, allowing the charities to see what funders are putting their money into. And then those funders to see how charities are otherwise funded. But it also allows them to spot gaps and anomalies and opportunities on both sides of the funder and funded uh, organisation. And they've, they've had a number of hack uh, events where they've allowed people to then develop further tools and platforms based on that data. 
Um, it's interesting to note from a Scottish perspective that only two of 32 local authorities in Scotland currently publish their funding data uh, to the 360 giving standard, despite offers of help and encouragement from our end. Um, and it should be said that I just got this this morning, but part of what they've developed um, very recently is a specific COVID-19 grant funding tracker. Uh, so as you can see, as of this morning, 3,000 something grants have been provided to 2,744 recipients, with over £50 million um, of uh, value to that. So, so that's one of the benefits. It's very easy to pull these stats and facts and figures, and, and be below this um, screen, uh, there are other um, ways of looking at the data as well. So, so another one, which is often the, the first thing that people think about in terms of open data, is um, the economic value of it. Um, and this this is a slide that I've used for quite a while. I've just adapted it tonight. Um, so there, are, there are, over the years have been many studies about the potential economic value of open data. Um, and I used to I used to quote quite regularly these four early ones, which date from 2011 to 2014, um, um, and would use them in conjunction. So you can see there that each found that the benefit of open data as a percentage of GDP varied in them from one. So was it 0.4 to 4.1 percent in those studies, um, and then more recently, uh, so it's a, I should say, Scottish estimated uh, GDP most recent figure is 170 billion for Scotland, um, and so if you took those studies and applied that GDP figure to it and said, well, if we did open data well at scale in Scotland, you would then anticipate that it would have a value to Scotland somewhere between 681 million and six. Point nine or seven, 7 billion almost. Um, and they always felt slightly dated, and you always felt as though you were looking for more up to date figures. And then suddenly the European Open Data Portal produced a quite substantial uh, and really well researched report, which came out in February 2020. Um, and it has come up with a figure. Uh, so it's looked at 15 studies, including these four, and it's come up with a figure. Uh, which would give us in Scotland um, 2.21 billion pounds per annum, taking the mean value of those 15. So as you can see, while well, most people would not naturally look at the economic values, um, there are a number of other values to that, um, including the social and so on, the, the benefits. Um, and so, so I guess in, in conclusion, uh, looking back at these things, you know, we've established in Scotland, so governments have got a legal obligation to produce the open data. The benefits are many and varied. There's a, a compelling economic case for governments to produce the better open data, but it doesn't all sit with government. Um, and there are many good examples of cases involving communities and other organisations working with government uh, and their data, but also self-generated curated data. Um, so I realised that probably just hadn't taken quite as long as I thought it would, um, but I hopefully um, that was worthwhile. Um, I've put the link to the slides there. Hopefully you can see that. Um, and also, I'm, I'm obviously happy to take questions now. We're at the end of the session with the other speakers. So, and also, I should say, I've also added some useful links at the end there as well. So, thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, so, yeah, now taking questions on uh, Twitter or on uh, go to the webinar. Um, uh, one quick question for me, Ian, which I think is the 2.2 billion pound question um, to a certain extent, but given that the the economic value is, um, the, the economic value is clear, do you have any feeling or on why it's something that still doesn't get recognized quite as readily? Um, n no, because, um, so I don't know who's on the call and I don't give away any secrets, but one of, one of the things that I get asked quite regularly in Scotland by senior civil servants and others is why why should we make our data available openly and so they're looking for an evidence base and quite often they're looking for an evidence base from Scotland where it's very difficult to establish one because there has been relatively little uh, data published I mean when I when I did a survey of this in January, February 2019 um, I, I, my estimation was about 5% of data in Scotland that should be open is currently open, so about 95% is, is not open yet. Um, so so the, the European Data Portal uh, report in 20, 
February 2020 has been very welcome in terms of being able to show the economic side of it. Um, I mentioned very early on in, in the talk that Scotland hadn't gone through the transparency agenda that um, the English go local government and so on had done. And I think that's certainly put us at a disadvantage north of the border, which is, and we've taken quite a long time to, to even start to recover from that. Um, interestingly, the, the recent, um, well, the, the current situation with COVID-19 has started, I think, to weaken a number of people up in government to the potential of open data. Um, and as I was involved in quite a, you know, quite a feisty campaign to get COVID data opened up in Scotland. And I think it's fair to say it probably north of the border, the COVID-19 data is probably a little bit better now than it is south of the border. Um, and so the people who are involved at core government in Scotland now, I think, start to appreciate that. Um, but I think, each, you know, each, each nation, as it were, is starting from a different point now. Um, and certainly local government in south of the border is quite farther ahead. So I think perhaps I'm not sure I quite answered your question, Simon. No, you absolutely have. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, I've got, we've got some questions coming in, uh, in fact, um, which, uh, well, first one from Peter Bell. Um, do you think that there might be a temptation to try and monetize data sets rather than allow free and open access? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm aware that that is happening. I'm aware that there are um, certain people whispering in the ears of chief executives and senior civil servants in Scotland, and that's exactly what they're trying to do. They're trying to get them to monetize um, the, the data on a commercial basis. And in Scotland, we have things like the Spatial Hub, uh, which seeks to do that. It seeks to take data and make it a paid service. And then they, they have a model of redistributing any profits back to local authorities. Um, I think it's flawed and I don't think it works and I don't think it scales. And I think it inhibits innovation. Um, so so we, I think we, we collectively have to be able to challenge those narratives. And the, the, you know, the big accountancy firms who are doing the whispering saying you should be, you should be monetizing this. Because I think the, the evidence certainly is that the, the bigger societal benefit comes from open data rather than from trying to sell, you know, your, your individual small data set, which you're going to sell, you know, once every 20 years for, you know, hundred pounds or something. Next question from uh, Pauline Roche um, on Twitter. Uh, can Ian say more about the last point on his second slide uh, about community groups? and their data and civil society data in general? Uh, let me find my Which slide, was it? Oh, rather me try to find the slide. Um, so, so can you repeat the question, please, Simon, and I will try and answer it. Sure thing. Uh, can Ian say more about the last point on his second slide about community groups and their data and civil society data in general? Yeah. Um, so, so there are there are a number of uh, groups out there who are working at either a, a local level or so I'm thinking like perhaps maybe some of the ODI nodes, for instance, are working some very interesting uh, piece of work. The ODI leads are very active, um, and so so they are they are really working in partnership with local authorities, local transport agencies, and so on. Um, but I'm also aware of other groups that are use, starting to use things like uh, Wikidata, which I'm you know really in really inspired to use quite a lot just now to capture data for themselves. So for instance, in Aberdeen, we have um, an air quality group that we co-founded um, and it's got, an, uh, and we've got about 40 sensors live around the city just now and other cities do similar things. Uh, it's, it's producing data and that data is available as open data on platforms through the Loof Datton platform. So, so I think there are, there are a number of grassroots organizations um, and collectives of individuals who are um, doing interesting things, some of which I think complement government, some work with government, some perhaps replace what um, just isn't happening uh, centrally. Um, and, gives, and certainly with air quality, for instance, it gives you a much more interesting picture of um, air quality in our city. Um, so we, we have about approximately 40 sensors. We've built about 70, but we, we haven't put the most recent ones live. Um, but the local authority has, I think, from memory, six or seven 
um, widely dispersed one, so we can get more granular data and so on. So, so you can you can complement and indeed um, you know far, fill in gaps much more easily as a community group than perhaps trying to get a multi tens of thousands of pounds sensor from from local government. Thanks, Ian. Uh, Pauline has pointed out correctly that I can't read. Um, she did it very clearly say your second last slide, uh, not your second yeah. slide. Hopefully that will have been um, the sort of answer she's looking for. Um, yeah. Pauline, if you've got any more questions, please put them in. Um, next one here from Anthony Harrison. Um, has much progress been made on open data in the private sector? Um, I, I, I'm not aware firsthand of very much, but I, well, perhaps, perhaps some of the other speakers will know better than me. There's something I'll leave perhaps. Um, um, but I certainly know, I've seen some case studies and reports of things where um, people have been working with private uh, sector groups to do that. What, one interesting one for me is the oil industry. So I, I live and work in Aberdeen and obviously we are the, the oil capital of Europe. Um, and oil companies are notoriously um, closed with our data because it's a commercial advantage and it's all com it's competitive. Um, there's been quite a movement both from the government and that side, but also from other operators. And we've done some data hack events with some of them um, to make some of that data available to work on. Uh, that The ones I was involved in was more of a temporary, put the data out for a hack and people could use it. Um, but the, the Oil and Gas Authority have established quite a substantial open data repository, some really interesting data in there, uh, so geospatial data and so on relating to the oil industry. So, so there are examples. It would be good for somebody perhaps to collate some of those um, in somewhere we could, we could reference and that would be really useful. Thank you. And um, a question from Jonathan Beeb. Uh, you mentioned APIs, but I haven't heard the word schema. Um, are schemas important to open data, um, i.e. as published open schemas? Do they exist? Um, they are important. Um, and so I'm, I'm really interested in how we move from, I guess, in some so quite, quite a few things I see are very early stage, you know, CSVs uh, getting dumped there. And, you know, very few people use the standard for CSV on the web, for instance, to actually describe um, the data that has been published. Um, Scottish Government's stats portals, which is stats.gov.uk, I think, I'll probably get that wrong, um, is set up by Swirl and it's got a very good underlying schema and is uh, quite rigorous, very rigorous actually in terms of the quality and so on. So so I think it's, it's in some cases it's quite early days, but I think having clear schemas um, that people can use and share um, and certainly to be encouraged and would like to see much more of that, yes. Um, and uh, another question from uh, Peter Bell. Uh, English local authorities must provide invoice data over a threshold amount on request. Um, Peter's aware of one business which uses FOI requests to collect this data, although they use, what do they know, code UK, so the FOI data is public. Um, is it isn't it surprising that the legal requirements provide the state doesn't extend to Scotland? Uh, yes, um, but it never has, it's, it's, and it's never been done. Um, and I personally have been involved with other people in using FOIs to get um, spending data released um, from Scottish local authorities. Um, I am hopeful. So, so you mentioned in your introduction that I was previously involved in the coordination of the Scottish Cities Alliance programme for the seven cities of Scotland. And when we conceived of that, and I, I first started it, we we wanted the seven cities to act together in order to provide some sort of beacon or exemplar of what good practice was. So uh, Stirling Council have just recently started to regularly publish open data on spending on their open data platform. Um, we wanted, um, I haven't been involved in this for a number of years, but we wanted those seven to do it to show the other 
25 um, in Scotland, that how it should be done. And it is patently ridiculous that you have to do it through FOI. And interestingly, I've seen some councils refuse it and have to even go to appeal to the information commissioner uh, to get the data actually published, which is just a nonsense these days. Right, that's the last question, Ian. Thank you so much uh, for the call.